Story 1. The infamous Jin Palace, standing three stories tall on a hill overlooking the city of Ras al Khaimah, 80 miles from Dubai, is a well known, haunted house filled with the most malevolent creatures, the jinn, among other inhuman things. Growing up in the UAE, I've heard about it my entire life. Stories of unexplained sounds, furniture moving around, residents being expelled, etc. The palace was built sometime in the 70s as the residence for the ruling family the Sheik of R.A.K. Dash. While there are no officially published accounts of what actually happened, we know that the family lasted only three days in there before abandoning it and moving to another residence. Sounds like BS? I know. I first attempted going there in the summer of 2011. We were bored, and we loved scaring ourselves shitless. Along with two friends, I hopped in the car and headed over to R.A.K. Two hours later, we found ourselves in the infamous city. Google Maps was not used in the UAE at the time, and hence we were lost. We attempted asking the residents for the location of the palace, but no luck. However, I was terrified by a very seedy-looking and overly chummy laborer who offered to help. Anyway, we headed back to Dubai disappointed. Fast forward four years, Jan 2016- I visited RAK with a group of friends for a birthday weekend at a beach resort. Ten of us headed over with the intention to relax, drink, smoke hookah, and just blow off some steam. And that we did on the first day. On the second day, we discovered that there wasn't much else to do. Their malls didn't impress us Dubaianess. The hot springs turned out to be a tiny murky pool, and the publicized ghost village was demolished a few weeks earlier. It was time to declare the mini staycation officially dead and head back to the glittering city of Dubai. That was the plan until a certain Ted, a new resident of the UAE, asked about the infamous palace and its location. Luckily, Google Maps was in full use and the location of the cursed structure was pinned. No one was in favor of setting a foot in that place, except for Ted and me. While everyone else packed up and headed back to Dubai, the two of us embarked on the trip that we'd come to regret. We pulled up off the main road, onto a dirt road, followed by the driveway and came face to face with the gate at around 2 p.m., only to find it locked with a piece of paper taped to it listing the guard's phone number. I called him up and told him that we wanted a tour of the place. Now keep in mind that the palace is a government-owned property and that tours are not allowed. A tiny Indian man, let's call him S, appeared from behind the gate and straight up asked to be compensated for the illegal tour he was about to give us. I handed him a 50 dirham bill, $13, as he led us inside. The only unlocked entry point is the half-open garage which led into the basement just under the hill. As we walked in, we were greeted by a giant spray-painted message that read Geo. As you can imagine, we felt incredibly welcomed. Our tour guide lacked basic language skills. His English was abysmal, but his Arabic was slightly below average which made every word he spoke even more terrifying. His pronouns were all over the place, which scared me even more. I wasn't sure if they actually referred to a group or it was simply a grammatical error. I was also in charge of translating the broken Arabic into English so that Ted could understand what's being said. S led us through the rooms and stopped to show us a glass filled with sewing needles, 
which he explained was something they ate. We continued our walk through the dark hallways and made our way up the first flight of stairs onto the ground floor where the main entrance is located but was sealed off years ago. We walked into a large round hall with the main entrance located at the center of the perimeter, along with other rooms spread around it. The double height walls around merged above us, creating a beautiful glass star-shaped atrium. Honestly, it wasn't that scary visiting it in broad daylight. And at that point my nerves were calm. It was a nice place, and they must have spent a ton of money on it. Having an elevator, in a personal residence, in the 70s, in the Middle East, was not something any commoner could swing. The extravagant furniture was left as is, strewn across all the rooms, along with children's school books, published in the 70s dash as if they left in the middle of the night and never looked back. I asked S about the previous residents and their mysterious abandonment of such a beautiful palace that must have cost them a fortune. Translated, they were only here for three days, but the loud banging on the doors drove them away. Furniture was getting flung across the rooms, lights flickering. They could also hear laughter echo through the halls. They couldn't stay, and no one has since. I don't even stay here at night anymore. I don't stay past 7 p.m. We continued making our way to the first floor where we entered a similar round hall with doors around us. To our right, a wall-mounted fountain cascaded. In the middle of this hall on the floor, we could see the top of the star atrium overlooking the level below. We checked out some of the rooms, which contained even more abandoned luxurious furniture and school books. We finally made our way to the top floor, the roof. Smaller in area than the other levels, this floor was by far the creepiest. The glass ceiling had bricks jammed through it, and it was badly damaged. Not the kind of glass ceiling shattering one hopes for. S spoke, they throw bricks to hurt the people. Be careful. Being the skeptic that I am, or trying to be dash, I tried finding an explanation for how those bricks ended up there. It was like someone chucked them from above. The only problem with that is A. It's the highest structure in the area B. There is nothing behind it. I decided not to think about it too much as we walked down the stairs to the exit. I turned to S and asked, What time do you usually witness weird things happening? Sounds? Things moving? I regretted that question the second it rolled off my tongue. After 9 p.m., he replied. We'll see you after 9 then. Call me when you get here, like I said. I don't sleep here anymore, so I'll need some time. S smiled as we said our goodbyes and drove away. We went back to the hotel, packed our suitcases, and checked out with the intention to return to the palace later that night. We ended up at a hookah lounge where we discussed the findings of our earlier adventure and fantasized about what we'd encounter a few hours later. I wanted it to be a full-on found footage Blair Witch Project adventure, and with the lack of a light source at the palace, we were in need of a night vision app. We both downloaded the first app listed in the store and started tinkering with it to see what it can do. It worked perfectly on both phones, and we even captured some test footage at the lounge. At around 10.15 p.m., we left the lounge and drove back to the dirt road just off the palace. I parked in the driveway, facing the structure, and called S to inform him that we've arrived. He said he needed 20 minutes. While we waited, 
I looked up at the palace and a feeling of dread came over me. It was as if I was sleeping and just woke up. What are we doing here? I asked as I turned to face Ted. We already went in. Why do we need to go in at night? Are you scared? Ted asked mockingly. I just have a bad feeling about this. Looking at it now, I can tell this is a mistake. Let's just head back to Dubai. Come on. We'll be fine. I don't know. I really don't want to do this. Something is telling me to turn back. Ted looked up at the palace and said, What's that? Over there? Pointing at what looks like something coming out of a window on the second floor. I do know. I can't make it out. Pull up the picture of the palace that we took during the day. Ted swiped his phone and pulled up the picture, and we both stared at it. Where's that window in the picture? I asked, it should be here, as he pointed to the right side of the house. Suddenly his screen goes black. That should have been our first warning, but we didn't think much of it at the time. He shoved it into the glove compartment, just as S peered into the car. You can't park here. You have to park around the corner, he said as he pointed to the edge of the fence. I got back in my car and drove off reluctantly. I wanted a quick getaway in case shit goes down. I didn't want to run out and then walk further away just to get in the car. But having a Dubai-plated car parked in the driveway of a government-owned building at night would have been suspicious. I got out of the car and followed S and Ted through the gate and towards the garage just like in our earlier visit. Before walking in, Ted and I both attempted to switch on our newly acquired night vision apps. I had no issues. The app came up and I started recording. Ted's second phone wouldn't let him pull up the app, despite the fact that it worked perfectly when he tried it at the lounge. This should have been our second warning. Yet again, we didn't think much of it, and I asked Ted to use the flashlight instead. We slouched under the garage door guided by Ted's and S flashlights with me somewhere in between attempting to document the nightmare I was experiencing. While it was beautiful during the day, the palace looked like something out of a James Wan movie at night. Dark, dingy, and just pure evil. We walked around the basement, just like we did before. Ted wanted to head up the staircase, and I wanted out. I slipped the phone into my pocket and demanded that we leave right away. If you want to go, just go and wait for me in the car. Ted replied as he began to climb the stairs. I stopped to evaluate my options here. I go up with him and face whatever terror lurks above us be. I stay still at the bottom of the stairs alone and be subjected to witness whatever walks, skips, or crawls past me see. I head back through the basement, through the garage, on my own and possibly have something jump at me in the dark. Hey, seemed like the wisest option as I've seen what happens to the idiot who separates from the group in a horror movie. Reluctantly, I followed the ballsier guy and the stranger onto the ground floor where the main entrance was. Ted and S walked into the hall while I stood as close to the staircase as possible for a quick getaway. Ted continued to explore the rooms before heading up to the next level. Once again I demanded that we leave, and was met with the decline from the others. I evaluated my options yet again. Follow them to the next level and make the escape even more difficult be... Stand still alone, see. Walk down a staircase, through the basement, and through the garage while something lurks in the dark waiting for me. 
As I made my way up the stairs and into the next hall, I pulled my phone out to record a video scan of the room as the others wandered off. I pulled up the app and switched from photo mode to video and accidentally snapped a photo of the empty room in the process and then proceeded to scan it quickly with the video camera. Ted had no problem checking out every room while I cowered next to S for a false sense of protection as he whispered horrible things in my ear about what he sees in the palace. In the entire place, we noticed only one room bolted with a padlock. Why is this room locked? I asked S. They come out here, banging on the door. We need to keep them in, fed up with the ambiguity, I yelled. Who are they? What are they? He smiled. Look through the keyhole if you want to know. One of my biggest fears is looking through. One of those old keyholes and seeing something looking back at me. And hence I declined his weird invitation. Ted, why don't you look through the keyhole? He says they come out at night in that room. Ted knelt down but didn't get too close. He attempted to shine his flashlight on the keyhole to see what or who was on the other side of that door and quickly jumped back on his feet, also declining the invitation. Suddenly, I heard something getting dragged across the floor. I could feel the vibration beneath my feet. It's on the same level, I thought to myself. I looked over at Ted to see if he could hear it and feel it too. He was already looking at me, eyes wide open. It's just a car, S hastily proclaimed. As the closest one to the window, I turned my head to see the same secluded dirt road. No sign of a car. Ted's tension started to build. He was finally getting scared and starting to lean towards leaving that forsaken place. We walked into some more rooms, with Ted leading the way, followed by me and S still whispering terror tales in my ear. I see it a lot. He said, what do you see? I replied, it has long hair, long nails, and red eyes. Where in the palace do you see it? I reluctantly asked, in the basement. He replied with a slightly terrified look on his face. Shit, that's our way out. We have to go through the basement to get out. And there's a creepy long-haired thing waiting for us there. I picked up the pace and caught up to Ted. We need to leave now. I whispered in his ear. Why? He just told me about this thing he sees in the basement. It has long hair, long nails, and red eyes. And I don't want to hang out long enough to see whether he's lying or not. He's actually scared. And if he's scared, we should be too. It was as if I finally knocked some sense into him. Or maybe the whole situation got to him. But at that point, Ted agreed with me. We turned back towards the staircase and informed S that we were leaving. He pleaded with us to check out the top floor one more time before we headed out, but we both strongly declined. I was finally happy. We were getting out of the Devil's Hornet and only a few hours away from home. S led the way down the stairs, followed by Ted and me. We passed the ground floor and only had two flights to go with a landing in the middle. I didn't want to be the last person. S was already at the bottom of the stairs waiting for us, while Ted was on the landing with me only a step behind him. I decide to pass him and get in the middle so I'm not prone to anything grabbing me. To this day, I swear that in the second I got past Ted. Something made me look back at him to see an object smash against his back with a loud thud. We both froze up. Could not move. Could not make a sound. 
I felt my whole body go numb, chills down my spine. At that moment, I didn't think we were going to get out of that house. Something got us. It knew we were there, and it wasn't going to let us out. We both looked up at the ceiling assuming it was the source of the chunk of plaster. It's an old building. A leak may have caused the chunk to drop from above us. The ceiling looked fine. It wasn't missing anything. We glanced back at the wall behind us to see a chunk missing. Based. On the trajectory and the force at which it hit Ed, he had a bruise on his back dash. It didn't simply fall. It looked as if something clawed it out and tossed it at us. It missed me by a couple of seconds. If I stayed behind Ted, it would have hit me dead center in the head. I'm still not sure if it was meant for me. Whatever was in that house probably heard me mutter verses from the Quran under my breath for protection the whole time we were there. Maybe it sensed danger. Still unable to speak, we both stood there. S looked up at the first floor landing, just across from the missing chunk. Terror filled his eyes. His jaw dropped open. He grabbed us by our arms and started running as fast as he could towards the exit, glancing back in horror every few seconds. The minute we reached the gate, he flung us out, just as we regained our basic senses. Don't scream, he shouted at us. Don't let a Brock hear you scream. Go, go now. IT saw you. IT knows you now. Go. We jumped in the car and I drove off as fast as I could. Still in shock, neither of us could speak. We both stared blankly at the road ahead, processing what had happened to us. I've never been the religious type, and I have no idea how I remembered those verses while in that palace. And for the first time ever I played a recitation of the Quran in the car from a YouTube video. It made me feel protected. While Ted was also whispering prayers, about an hour away from Dubai, Ted finally spoke. I want to see the videos you recorded on the app. I don't want to look at them now. We'll watch them tomorrow, in broad daylight. I want to now, fine. I handed him my phone, and he proceeded to pull up the app's gallery. Where are the videos? They're in the gallery. The only video here is the one from the hookah lounge. He handed me the phone, WDF. I recorded three videos there. I'm sure. I saw them saved in the gallery. I flipped through my phone. Wait, there's a picture from the house. I accidentally snapped it when I was switching the mode. The picture is of the seemingly empty room I was aiming my camera at, and just in front of me is a shadowy figure facing me. I didn't see the picture while I was there. We have no idea what it is. I'll try to post a link to it later. So we got home. Neither of us slept through the night. We avoided watching horror movies for about two months and we both suffered from minor shock symptoms. Here's the freaky thing. The next day I saw my mom. She knew I was spending the weekend in RAK with friends, and that I'd be coming back the previous day at some point. When I saw her the next morning, she asked me what time I got back to Dubai. I told her that it was around 1 a.m. She goes, I had a really bad feeling last night. Like something happened to you. I'm used to you traveling and leaving Dubai. But this time it was different. I couldn't sleep. Did anything happen? I never mentioned that I was going there. It was planned on the same day. I ended up telling her what happened. Showed her the picture. And she was thoroughly freaked out. Story 2 A djinn followed me home from the Gulf War. 
I'm talking about the first war with Iraq under H.W. Bush in 1990. Just to be clear, I was stationed at a U.S. base in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Saddam threw his Scud missiles at us, but he was such a bad shot, they landed in the middle of nowhere. Fortunately for everyone. Unfortunately for me. The middle of nowhere in Arabia is called the Empty Quarter. It is the vastest contiguous desert in the world. It is the size of Texas. Humans don't live there. But something else does. I was assigned to recover what the Scuds carried. My job was to find the Scud, identify the payload, and collect any remnants of that payload. You see, Saddam had all kinds of poison gas, and we knew from what he did to the Kurds that he wasn't afraid of using them. WMDs are no joke. So if the Scud doesn't explode and a missile full of mustard gas is sitting in the desert, it could find its way into a dirty bomb under New York. My job was to make sure that never happened. Finding this Scud wasn't easy. Radar and satellite only tracked it to a general location within the empty quarter. I drove with my team into the desert, to the last human settlement before the world turns into an endless waste. This was the patch of sand the Bedouins of the Almara tribe called home. They lived mostly as they had for millennia. In a cluster of sheepskin tents, aided only by their camels. In a 20th century twist, they all had AK-47s. And they greeted us by pointing those AKs in our faces. These tribesmen looked like they came out of a Bible story, dressed in simple cloaks with white turbans wrapped around their heads. Their chic was slightly fancier. A heavy-set man of about 60, he wore the typical red and white Saudi headdress. His beard was dyed red, and he walked with a plain, wooden cane. Peace be upon you, O Sheik, I said in my best Arabic. I'm good with languages, and picked it up after taking a few classes and conversing with allied Arab soldiers. We come with the peace and blessings of God. So we unloaded the boxes of rice, bread, and canned supermarket goods that nomadic hunters don't get to eat. These were treats to them, and their trust would help us get to the scud. We talked within the hospitality of the sheik's tent. Floor cushions embroidered with red and black stripes stretched across the inside. He served us that rich Arabic coffee that makes an Italian espresso taste like baby milk. You are looking for the missile. We all saw it, the sheik said. Did it explode? I asked. It happened at night. The sheik gulped his coffee. The ground did not shake and the horizon did not light up with fire. Can you tell us exactly where it fell? Yes, but you cannot go there. We can go anywhere. Even if it's in a mountain, we'll fly up with a chopper. You cannot go there because it is forbidden. The sheik arose and walked out of the tent. I followed him to a well. Little Bedouin boys were playing tag around it. There was something odd about their faces, about their eyes. I only got a glance, but I swear, they had no pupils. The sheik told them to go home, and they ran off. These are the lands of the Almara, the sheik said, and have been for thousands of years. But those lands, he stared down into the depths of the well. I peered down at him. The chasm seemed endless. Well, whose lands are they? I asked. They belong to a different tribe. He tapped his cane against the ground. A tribe of the jinn. 
The sheik explained the details to me. God created man out of clay and jinn out of smoke. The two creations live in separate dimensions here on this earth, but there are places where these dimensions cross. In the empty quarter, there is one such place. But that's not all. There are many tribes of jinn. Some are good, some are wicked. In the empty quarter lives such a wicked tribe of jinn that God forbade them from ever leaving. There is one loophole, though. Those jinn are imprisoned there, and they all want to leave, the sheik said. But God has forbidden them from leaving. There is only one way they can get out, and that is from within a human body. I wish I'd listened to the old man, but I wasn't interested in cautionary tales for Bedouin children. I bribed one of the young men of the tribe with a 500 rial note, worth about $130, and he told me what we needed to know. The operation went perfectly. I didn't notice anything strange about the patch of sand where the unexploded scud lay. We recovered the scud's six-ton payload in a truck and were back in Riyadh by evening the next day. After that assignment, I was sent to Kuwait as part of the Liberation Force. Saddam rained scuds on us all day, but none of them hit. It was an easy win for good o well, Uncle Sam. And when the war was over, I came home like everyone else. Some came home in body bags, others with PTSD, and some came home just fine. I thought I was the latter. But I came home with a gin that wants to kill me. The day I came home was the happiest in my life. My six-year-old, Daniel, had grown so much. He jumped into my arms while my wife, Angela, hugged us both. For now, Uncle Sam was done defending the world, so I could be with my family. The next day, we barbecued steaks in the backyard and I bought my son a trampoline. Don't jump too high, or an eagle will snatch you. I told him. Daniel laughed it off. He was already too old for such bullshit. Angela made us delicious lemonade, and later that night we all lay in the grass and gazed at the stars. That one is called Al Ghul, I said pointing at a bright star in the Perseus constellation. It's Arabic for demon. I pretended like I was a demon, grabbed my son, and tickled him. I can't describe how good it felt to enjoy the mundane with my family. You know Arabic, Daddy? Daniel asked. At that age, sons are so impressed with their fathers. I do. And if you ever meet an Arab, you should say to them, Assalamu alaikum. Aslam alkum. What's that mean, Daddy? It means peace be upon you. But my peace was about to evaporate, like a glass of water under the scorching desert sun. Because the next morning, I saw the jinn. In fact, I see it every morning. I can only see it in the moments between sleep and wakefulness, when my body is paralyzed. A pitch-black creature, as if covered in soot. It's so tall, the ceiling forces it to bend its back at a right angle, so that its head is right over my bed. Its face looks strangely human, but its eyes have no pupils like those little Bedouin boys playing around the well. It says to me, in Arabic, Today you will die. Today you will die. Today you will die. It repeats this incantation until I wake up. And when I do, I spend each day trying not to die. The jinn itself cannot kill me. It can only affect me. Sometimes when I'm driving, it will conjure this fog into my head and body that makes everything so heavy that I want nothing more than to sleep. 
I've been in three car crashes in the last 26 years and spent weeks in the hospital as a result, but I'm still alive. Last month I was chopping vegetables with a kitchen knife, and it told me there was a treasure in my wrist, a magic whistle, and if I got it out and blew on it, Angela and Daniel would come back to life. When the EMTs found me passed out with my wrist mangled, of course they thought it was a suicide attempt. How typical for a veteran to try to kill himself. The month of therapy, paid for with your tax dollars, didn't cure me of the gin. I've called every kind of exorcist, Islamic, Catholic, Jewish, hell, even Zoroastrian. They've performed every kind of exorcism. The jinn are not affected at all. I realize now what that old sheik called jinn may be something else. Because these creatures surely were not created by God. Truth be told, I don't even know if I believe in God. But I know I believe in the devil. Call me a stereotype, but I like guns. I had a Mosin Nagant, an old Russian World War II rifle, that I kept locked in a gun cabinet. Target practice with the old beast was one of the few things that took the edge off of life. About a year after I returned from the war, I was cleaning the bore of the gun in my kitchen, while my wife and son bounced on the trampoline in the yard. The gin told me to look in the sky. There was a scud coming, a rocket flying through the heavens. The whine of the scud pierced the air and boomed through my ears. I knew unless I shot it down, the explosion and payload of mustard gas would kill everyone in sight, my family included. I assembled and loaded my gun, rushed into the yard, and shot at the scud in the sky. That was the only time I'd heard the gin laugh, like the broken notes of a piano. Daniel lay spread out on the trampoline, with a bullet hole in his head from my Mosin Nagant. The sky was clear, and my wife's shriek replaced the booming of the scud. Angela hung herself twelve days later. I would have done the same, but I don't want to die. The court declared me insane, and I spent 24 years in a loony bin, where getting killed or killing yourself was as impossible as it gets. The gin did not like that, but it was its fault. After all this time, I think I finally know how to get rid of it. No, I'm not going to kill myself. Despite all that's happened, I want to live. I realize now that the djinn wants me dead because it is literally stuck inside me the same way it was stuck in the empty quarter. When it went inside me 27 years ago, it traded one prison for another. But if I die, then it's free to roam the world and maybe find someone else to torment. That's all it wants. So that's what I'll give it. I'm going to go into cardiac arrest to stop my heart. But a few minutes before I do that, I'll call 911 so that the EMTs can arrive in time to revive me. That way, the djinn will be able to escape the prison that is my life, and I'll come back from the dead. I might suffer some brain damage, but if I time it right, it will be minimal. I saw this on a show called House once. The main character sticks a knife in a socket to electrocute himself and stop his heart, so he can find out if there is an afterlife. But because he's in a hospital, he's revived after a few minutes. So here I go, dialing 911. I can already hear the ambulance sirens, and I can see the gin its body at a right angle and its head twisted on its long neck. It's smiling at me with the widest, widest eyes. 
Now it's laughing. Laughing its broken piano laugh. Like the day when it made me kill my son. And I realize. What if this is a trick? What if this is how it kills me? There's no going back. I'm leaving this note here. So just in case I don't return. You all know my story. Maybe in those moments between life and death. I'll see Angela and Daniel. And they'll hug me like the day I came home from the war. Because the truth is, I never came home. But maybe I can now. So here I go. Wish me luck. And peace be upon you all. Story 3 I wish I hadn't. The gin produced a cigarette from thin air and lit it with his finger. Here's the deal, he said blowing out a plume of purple smoke. Three wishes. No paradoxical shit either. What I mean by that is you can't wish to go back in time to hump your grandma so you turn into your own grandpa or whatever weird shit you're into. And you can't wish for more wishes. Three wishes. That's it. And you're going to screw up even those wishes. I just know it. I thought about what a mess my life was and how I might turn that around. I had, I believed, a good heart and a moderate amount of ambition, but no money. First wish is for a billion dollars, I said. Sure thing, boss, said the gin. So that's it? I asked, astonished. You like to transfer it to my bank account or something? I'm a billionaire now. The gin wheezed out a laugh. Not yet, he said. Money doesn't grow on trees, you know. I waited. Well, I said at last. Where is it? The gin pointed at a young couple walking through the park a little ways from where we were sitting on the bench. There, he said. You see? Sure. I said, I see two people walking through the park. So what? They've got hot dogs. Uh, okay. Only place that sells dogs within a one mile radius of here is Frank's Doggies over on 5th, right? Uh, I guess so, I said. I don't see where you're going with this. Watch, said the gin flashing a creepy grin. He stood up and walked over to get in the path of the couple. I felt very tense and confused. Then the gin was standing right in front of the couple and the flesh on his hands melted away to reveal knives, catching the glint of the artificial lights above. Before I could understand what was happening, the gin plunged one knife into each abdomen in front of him. The girl and the boy. Their eyes went wide and they dropped their hot dogs as the blood soaked through their shirts and spread out. The gin pulled the knives out and stabbed them again. The boy fell back, clutching his stomach, and the girl tried to scream, still impaled on the blade. A gush of blood ran out of her mouth. The gin pulled her closer and then stabbed her in the side of the head with his free blade. After that, she was silent. I watched all of this in complete horrified shock, unable to do anything, unable to think about doing anything. The girl dropped to the ground and the gin pounced upon the boy who was desperately trying to run away. He was nowhere near fast enough. The gin sunk both blades into the boy's back, and that was it. I pulled out my phone and stared blankly at it. What was I going to do? Call the police? Tell them that a gin murdered two people in front of me, and I was the only witness? I put the phone away and looked up just in time to see him walking back towards me. Frank's Doggies only accepts cash, so I figured they'd have some on them, 
said the djinn. He had regular hands again, and used them to toss a crumpled and bloodied wad of dollar bills on my lap. I wasn't wrong. Only nine hundred, ninety-nine million, nine hundred ninety-nine thousand, nine hundred and eighty-eight dollars to go. But I promise you this. We will get a billion before you die. Oh, look, businessman at ten o'clock. I'll bet he's loaded. The gin stood up as my brain finally grasped what was going on. Wait, I said. The gin stopped in his tracks and turned to me with a horrible smile. Let me guess, he said. You want to cancel that first wish? I looked over at the mutilated bodies of the young couple. I do. That's fine. Gonna cost you another wish, though. What? I said in disbelief. That's not fair. I said that I wanted a billion dollars. Not that I wanted to murder people to get it. Well, you didn't say that you didn't want to murder people. Honestly, I don't think you have much of a case here. You can use another wish to cancel your first wish, or I can disembowel that guy over there and rifle through his wallet. Up to you. Fine, I said. Fine. I use my second wish to cancel my first wish. Done, said the djinn, walking back over and sitting down next to me again. My pulse slowed down, but only a little bit. Why are they still dead? I asked, pointing to the two corpses. I canceled the wish. Well, if you cancel your HBO subscription, it just means that you can't watch any more HBO, right? Not that HBO comes and erases your brain so that you forget all of the shows that you did watch already. You see, if you want those people back alive, it's gonna cost you your final wish. God damn it. All right. I wish that those people were alive again. Are you sure? Asked the djinn. You know, you could just be more specific about the billion dollars. Like, you want it now, and you don't want anybody harmed in the process. Come to think of it, you could have done that for your previous wish. But it's not too late. You could still have the billion dollars. I struggled with what he was saying. I could have a billion dollars, but I would have to live with the guilt of those two dead bodies. I thought again about how shitty my life had become. A ruined marriage, with alimony and child support to pay, and a job that never paid enough. I thought of all the things I could do for my kid for myself. We'd never have to worry about a thing again. Never have to worry about hospital visits, or broken down cars, or working some dumbass nightmare job all our lives. The djinn interrupted my thoughts. Of course, you got these two dead bodies here that somebody's gonna discover in about 30 seconds. He nodded down to my crotch where the wad of bloody bills was. And here you are, covered in their blood. Doesn't look good for you, man. I felt sick, and my head was spinning, but I pulled myself together. I told you. I wish that those two people were alive again. Last chance. Are you sure that's your wish? For the third time, yes, I said. The djinn snapped his fingers, and suddenly the quiet of the park was pierced by anguished screams as the boy and the girl were reanimated. Two things, said the djinn. First, I never had to grant you three wishes. Once you rubbed that lamp, that was it. I was free. This was just for kicks. Second, you should have once again been more specific and said something like, I wish that couple were still in the condition they were in before you stabbed them a bunch. Pretty simple. 
I looked over to the couple, writhing in unimaginable pain. The businessman was now running towards them. Please let me die, screamed the boy. Welp, said the jinn, standing up and pretending to brush himself off. Been fun. Guess I'm off to make more dreams come true. Story 4 The Thing About Jinns I had made a friend in med school, Hamida. We were good friends, ambitious and kindred spirits. There was even some talk of going on a girl's trip to Europe together after the second semester. But after half a semester, she stopped coming. And I thought that maybe she must have dropped out because med school is tough and not just everyone can deal with it. I tried calling her cell, but no one would pick it up. Then one day, my friend Mira came to me and said, Oh, Bella, have you heard the latest? Hamida has become possessed by a djinn. Now, djinns are not really Indian ghosts. Persian, maybe. But they are supposed to be spirits who possess girls and are particularly partial about girls with long black hair. True to myself, I discarded the claim and then urged Mira to accompany me to Hamida's house. The atmosphere of the house itself was scarier than the situation, for hers was a majestic rundown house just beside the cemetery. Hamida's mother was very hospitable and served us tea to drink as she explained her daughter's condition to us with a tired and worried expression on her face. She does not eat, but late at night, we hear the voice of a screaming animal, and the next day, we come to know that some neighbor's chicken or goat is dead, with only its carcass left. She becomes increasingly violent at times. Her health is going down. There is no light left in her eyes. All that is left is that hair of hers. My daughter has left that body. It is not her inside it, but some relentless devil, she said, seemingly a little disgusted and angry while telling us regarding the hair. We had had enough warning. We wanted to see Hamida now. Her mother led us to her room. Her room had a green aura to it. She was chained to one of the bedposts. She seemed sickly, and as an aspiring doctor, I felt that I should check whether she had a fever or not. I went close to her, ignoring her mother's warnings. I was about to feel her forehead when she abruptly awoke and clutched my hand. Her hand seemed to like hot burning coal, and my flesh seemed to be burning where she had touched. I tried to get away from her grasp. At this point, I had started shouting so loudly that even the buried corpses in the nearby cemetery would have started complaining regarding the noise. Mira came to my aid, and she started pulling at me. This led to a weird game of tug-of-war between Mira and the possessed Hamida, and I felt like my arm would come loose from my body in this struggle. Then, hearing my screams, Two men came inside the room followed by Hamida's mother. The two men helped Mira to free me from Hamida's grasp, who had suddenly grown oh so powerful. When Hamida let go of my arm, she grasped a strand of my hair and exclaimed something in a foreign language. Being smooth, my hair simply slipped out of her hands. Then. The other men put a tobbies like thing on my friend's head and this time, it was her turn to scream. After the screaming ceased, she lost consciousness. I was quite shocked by the encounter and quite taken aback by it all. I was made to sit down, and while Mira told me to take deep breaths, 
Hamidism, I patted my back. A few moments later, I gained my composure. And then I saw that while I had thought that the woman had been patting my back, what she had really been doing was braiding my hair. Then, she said, See, now you see what the jinn has done to my Hamida. She is going to die. I know it, and I have come to terms with it. But Bella Beta, when Hamida had taken your hair in her hand and spoke, then it was the jinn who had spoken, and he had said in Urdu that it liked your hair. So, maybe you should keep your hair in a braid, just to be safe. Mira and I went to the med school to get my arm taken care of, and also to talk to the principal regarding Hamida's situation. T-H, she said on hearing about it. Such a fateful end to such a bright student. And those beautiful long back locks of hers. As she said that, I thought of my own long black locks which came down to my waist, and which were at the moment, in a braid. I pondered regarding the situation, and decided that something has to be done. I did not wish to be the subject of anyone's T-E-E-H. The gin seems to have taken a liking to my hair, therefore, I must do something regarding this. Two days after our visit to Hamida's house, she died. I didn't go to her funeral, but the ones who went told me that there was nothing of Hamida's former vigor or beauty in the corpse. Her beautiful skin had become a jaundiced yellow color, and her face had become hollow. The only thing that had remained were her beautiful long hair. Three days after our visit to Hamida's house, I took matters into my own hands. I cut my hair up to my shoulders and dyed an inch of it blue. I looked like a K-pop fangirl, which I'm not. When I went home for the holidays, my wish that I shall never hear anyone's TCHDCHDCH, which is the Indian sign of disapproval and disappointment, remained unfulfilled. Because, as my mother opened the door and studied my extreme makeover, the first words that escaped my mother's mouth were, TCHDCH, what have you done to your hair? You look like a clown. Well, I guess I can live with that. Story 5 The Dark Gin I am not a writer. I do not know how people use words and do wonders. All I know is this. I found that I was walking in the dark, alone, with only one house visible in the countryside with a graveyard to my left and a patty, rice, Field to my right. What am I doing here? Is this a dream? I thought. I have never touched alcohol, drugs. Was I drugged? Why am I not at home warm and secure? Thoughts racing in my mind. I was hoping that it was a dream, but no. It was real. I could feel it. Now I remembered as I briskly walked towards the only house I could see, I was supposed to be on a bus. The last thing I could recall was that I was on a bus, and the bus had stopped for dinner. There were forty-odd other passengers with me. Where were they? As I reached the house, I felt heavy. The house was a traditional rural Indian home made of mud with no furniture. I got in. It was spacious to my surprise. That was what I think now, but it was the last thing on my mind then. No one was in there. Scared. I could feel my heart in my mouth. I couldn't go further than the first room. I retired there and waited for the sun to rise. I thought I would be dead by morning. Night was long, very long. I fell asleep, only to be woken up back on the rough road where I had started. I was shivering. 
I ran away from home. I had seen him, only briefly, but yes, I had seen him. It was just like a dream. His long black darkened hands. His big head, unusual long features. I had seen him earlier as well. When I had alighted from the bus for dinner, I had gone to pee in the fields as the Daba's washroom was under construction, cheap Indian restaurant on a highway. I had lost consciousness after seeing his dark face. I had probably pissed him off when I peed on burned crops. Maybe it was his food. Funny, right? Maybe you won't find it funny if it happened to you and your life is ruined. The second time I had seen him was in that abandoned home. He had caught me by the head and dragged me out. I ran. I couldn't see anything, but I was just running. I had lost my right shoe. The rough road was hurting my foot. My socks were torn. After half an hour of the marathon, I could see the highway, but exactly then someone pushed me and I fell and stumbled. I had probably broken my face and knees. I lost my consciousness, but before that I could feel something cool on my face. Blood. I woke up in a government hospital the next day. It was hard to explain to the police what had happened. They thought I was a gang member. Blah, blah. I called home and the next day was picked up by my cousin. I was in the hospital for three days. I reached home. I was relieved. It had finally ended. But I was in bed for weeks. First I had fever, then appendicitis, then kidney stone. I would never be well. Something or other illness always got me. I finally recovered, but I am very thin and pale. My girlfriend dumped me because people say I am not normal. But I finally got back on track a bit and rejoined work. One day when I came back home from the office, I found my lost right shoe near the kitchen door. He has dark black, red eyes. Sometimes he is taller than usual. He does not like perfumes. He likes to eat bones and burn wood. He is probably an outcast in his society. He is a criminal and he does stuff for magicians and astrologers. He still comes and visits me. He won't leave me or forgive me till I die. 